The 30-year Cold War between the U.S. and Soviet Union led the world to the brink of nuclear war and also forced technological advances in a number of fields. In 1963, the brand new nuclear submarine, the Thresher, was the fastest, quietest, deepest boat in the American arsenal, and that made it the best attack sub in the world. You were riding in the baffles, you know, of a, you know, of a, a Soviet submarine, and the Soviet sub didn't even know you were there. You know, a, uh, a senior chief that I interviewed once down in Kings Bay, Georgia, says, you know, back in the Cold War, we went to sea and we owned them. The battle for undersea supremacy is deadly serious. Nuclear missile subs called boomers are the most destructive weapons ever created. America's Cold War boomers carry up to 24 intercontinental missiles, each with multiple nuclear warheads. A single sub carries enough firepower to completely destroy any country on Earth. Silent, hidden, they can strike anywhere without warning. In many ways, they are what they were in the 60s, the ultimate weapon. The common currency in submarine warfare is silence. The person who betrays his location first is probably going to die first. The main defense against boomers is the attack sub, like the Thresher. The attack subs designed to find and kill boomers were vital to the security of both sides. The most modern materials, the most cutting-edge techniques went into each new series. So in the case of Thresher, you have a submarine that's the best we ever did. It was, a, it was a magnificent ship in every, in every possible way. Uh, she was quiet, she was deep running. Because of her speed, she could be a bear submerged. Because, again, they're on the cutting edge. This is a fast ship going very deep. Thresher was built in Portsmouth, New Hampshire and launched in 1960. After her first sea trial, she was brought back to the yard for a refit. Cracked welds and a number of other defects were repaired. With the kind of pressures that exist deep below the surface of the ocean, the builders and the Navy both knew how vitally important every weld was. You had to have a master welder laying down that bead of, of, of weld to make sure that the uniformity, right, the consistency, the quality of the weld was extraordinary. Only a sample of Thresher's welds were checked during construction and after her sea trials. Then she put out to sea again, followed by the submarine chaser Skylark. She would dive to her maximum depth in a series of steps, then return to the surface. The actual maximum depth is still classified, but as soon as Thresher reached it, something happened. Just after nine o'clock, right, Skylark got a transmission from Harvey, the captain, who said, if I remember, if I can paraphrase it properly, that he was experiencing what he called minor difficulties. He had, uh, posi he, had, he had positive buoyancy and an up angle, and he was attempting to blow. It was a transmission that haunted naval investigators for years. A minor difficulty at maximum depth, and blowing the tanks was an emergency measure, a last resort. It meant forcing compressed air from flasks into the boat's buoyancy tanks to make her lighter than water so she could float upwards. But normally, with a nuclear power plant, you simply drove the boat to the surface. If you do an emergency blow at test depth, you're gonna come up like a cork, right? And it's very, very difficult to control the ship at all. Now, Skylock's wondering what in the world, attempting to blow. After the first transmission came some garbled words. Skylark's crew waited in growing horror as the silent seconds ticked by. Meanwhile, at the bottom of the ocean, the Thresher's captain must have seen what was coming. The sub drifted deeper and deeper, helpless, without power, without the ability to surface. He could do nothing but wait as the boat sank deeper and deeper until finally crushed depth. Over the underwater telephone aboard Skylark came the unmistakable sound of a submarine being crushed by the immense pressure of the ocean. The men aboard were killed in a fraction of a second. It was an engineering disaster that rocked the Navy to its core. A salvage vessel recovery, uh, which is on the scene, uh, sighted an oil slick. So I conclude with, with great regret and sadness uh, that this ship with 129 uh, fine souls aboard is lost. What probably happened 
was one of those silver braids joints gave away. Now, if you're down at test depth and you even have a minor fracture on a silver braze joint, the water's going to come through with the power, you know, of a, of, of a pressurized water cleaner. It'll, it's going to blind you. It's going to be very, 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 very difficult to find what the source of the casualty is and how to contain it. As with most large engineering disasters, a whole string of unlikely events had to occur at the same time to destroy the Navy's finest submarine. With all her problems, even with her nuclear reactor shut down, why couldn't Thresher simply blow its ballast tanks and float to the surface? The Navy tested the question on another sub, the Tenosa. What they found out was remarkably instructive. The valve system through which the compressed air had to pass in order to get to the ballast tanks was not only very narrow, we would expect that, it also had a cage-like device over it that allowed the air as it passed to leave behind any particulate matter, any dust or particles or whatever. When Tenosa tried to blow, she got a complete hard coating of ice on that little cage and it stopped the blow. He couldn't blow. At maximum depth, with the nuclear power plant offline and leaking, that was the final straw. The Navy had discovered the final link in the long chain of events that ended in disaster. Without the ability to blow its tanks and surface, Thresher's last hope was gone. Two deep sea submersibles later found and photographed the wreck of the Thresher 8,400 feet below the surface of the Atlantic. There is wreckage strewn along the bottom, including a piece with her hull number on it. Amazingly, the conning tower seems in perfect condition. Meanwhile, the Navy continued to ponder what could have happened. No one has actually seen a submarine implode, but experts believe it doesn't flatten like a crushed soda can. Rather, water at 80,000 pounds per square inch punches a hole into the boat and in milliseconds it blows through every partition inside. The boat itself retains most of its shape because the pressure inside and outside is equalized so fast. The men don't have time to drown. They never know what hit them. 